Welcome to Failing For You, where I'll fail so you don't have to, or even better yet, so you can too. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Failing For You. I'm your host, Jordan Yates, and today we have a very special guest with us. Welcome everybody, Mark Levine. I am so excited to have him here today. We've had him on the books for a while, and he has just got so much good information to share. You're going to want to listen to this entire episode. Mark, would you please introduce yourself? Well, Jordan, I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you for asking me. Uh, My name is Mark Levine. Currently, I am the talent acquisitions lead and also the uh, learning and development lead for Thermo Systems, which is an industrial controls company based in East Windsor, New Jersey. We're international. Uh, We focus on various types of control systems for life sciences, district energy, and data centers, mission critical as we call it. So... uh, Long, extensive background in recruiting and human resourcing that dates back to the late 80s, excuse me, late 70s. <laughs> I wanted to say 80s because I didn't want to embarrass myself, but I oh go, I go goodness. back to the Stone Age. <laughs> Mark is experienced is what he's trying to say, but he's also very young. He's been working since he was four. That's how he's been around that long. <laughs> yeah, I colored my hair gray and it should be really dark blonde. <laughs> oh my goodness he's just trying to appeal to the older audience guys mark's actually he's just what 20 25 something around yeah, there 29 <laughs> okay yeah that's we'll give him that one <laughs> but guys mark as a professional in the hr hiring space i thought it'd be very interesting to have him on here one he has a very big linkedin presence and is continuously putting out information that's very helpful to people looking for jobs and how to hire and i figured who better to hear from than someone with this much experience so if you want to learn a bit about being on the interview side of the interviewer or the interviewee this is somebody that's going to help you with both he's going to teach us a little about some experiences he's had firsthand some things that he's failed at maybe seen other people fail at and what we can learn from it so we're really excited um i guess our very first question would be something that we were talking about beforehand that someone actually wrote in which i think is a great way to get into this episode which is what is industrial psychology let's go back again to the dark ages you know when (laughs) when people went through guillotines and things along those lines now uh industrial psychology was kind of the forerunner of human resources college style For example, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a field called personnel. It was basically paper management. Uh, People kept things on file related to someone's employment at an organization. Uh, It didn't take a college degree. It didn't take a whole lot of information. People kind of learned it on the job. In the early 90s, human resources took over for that. Uh, It was a movement to get what was personnel to the boardroom table so that they can impact on the employment relationship at companies. So HR came about, and at that time, certifications were uh, put forth by SHRM, or or SHRM as some people like to consider it, the Society of Human Resources Management. There was the PHR and SPHR, which was the two examinations that qualified people for human resources. So back in my day, industrial psychology just taught basically the psychology of working, uh, the kinds of situations that took place between employees and employers on the job. Uh, Probably a lot of it doesn't even apply very much anymore. Some of it does. But it's like anything else. Uh, HR or personnel evolved into HR and human resources uh, degrees have really managed to include a lot. Everything from the legal parts of HR, which could be employee relations, uh, labor negotiations, you know, to compensation and benefits, uh, everything having to do with learning and development. There's so much. And, and all that meat is what got us as HR professionals at the boardroom table. We had a lot to offer the CEOs. 
Yeah, I can imagine that and just the the regulations over the years that have changed from like the equal rights and the non-discrimination and all of that being added in. Like that's a lot of legislation to have to keep up with and adapt to. Like, do you do you remember any acts in particular that have happened where it felt like it really changed your job? Well, there have been a lot of changes over the years. A lot had to do with uh, equal employment opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, back in those days in the, the late 70s, 80s, you know, we've evolved a lot since then. Of course, the, the coming of the 401k, which pretty much did away with pensions at most companies. So people mm-hmm. had to uh, make decisions about that, how their money was going to be invested for retirement. Uh, there were a number of changes, uh, particularly in areas that just didn't exist like they do today, like learning and development. It was never really considered the employer's job to uh, train people uh, in what Mm -hmm. the high schools and colleges should have been training them in. But back in the late 80s and 90s, a lot of studies were done and we found that people's skill sets were lagging far behind their writing skills, their math skills. So that was the evolution of learning and development, which has gone far beyond that now. Now we're into things like uh, management training, soft skills is very big in industry. Yeah, so it's not just especially this one. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's not just the legal changes, it's the evolution of, of the entire uh, employee-employer relationship that has brought all this, this stuff to the job. You know, years ago, companies weren't concerned about transportation to the job. Yeah. It was like, you get there. You know, years ago, back in the, uh, I guess, late 80s, I was the chairman of a transportation management association that focused on helping employees get to work. And it was funded by employers. So, again, these are the things that come up as employers and employees needs change. and, And it all falls under the jurisdiction of human resources. It's so interesting because I feel like a lot of times when we think of HR, it's basically what is the offer letter you're sending me and, um, you know, no inappropriate work talk or don't post weird stuff online. Like it, it's crazy to think you guys do so much more beyond that just to like make it possible for us to be in the workspace and be comfortable. And just, it is such an evolving field. And I, I find it to be very fascinating. Um, a lot of people in my life are asking me for advice, like how to find good jobs or how to, you know, work on your resume and things like that. Um, so I'm excited to have you on here for that purpose. Hey, Jordan, before, say, we, before we move on, just to put us where yeah. we are today, our key initiatives this year at Thermo are wellness and volunteerism. So wow. now we've stepped up to something more and something new. So just that is, to show you that, that we continue to move forward. <laughs> yeah, no, that is so cool. Um, just because like that has nothing to do with money, which a lot of times companies' goals are like grow money, this money, that, but wellness as an initiative, I love that. How do you, how do you guys implement that? Like what are your objectives when implementing wellness? We want to keep everybody healthy so that they continue to work and have productive lives. And you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, we don't bra- we don't brainstorm it or dream it up. We do we read various uh, studies. And, and this mm-hmm. is what, you know, Generation Z and and some of the more recent generations are looking for. So we try to adapt to it. Most people today looking for a job want to work for a socially responsible company. So we are that. We do a lot for veterans. We do a lot for various organizations uh, because it's a a form of our employer branding. that People can see that we're a good place to work, that we care, that we're not just in it for ourselves, that we're really in it for uh, for everyone, uh, you know, any yep. any organizations that we can help out, we, we certainly consider doing that. We support all the team members here of getting involved and volunteering, and that's what that's going to look like. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're very progressive in the way we uh, respond to change. I mean, we are constantly looking to see what's coming next, and we try to yeah. adapt and embrace it. That's so cool that you guys are doing that. Something when I changed jobs almost a year ago now that I was really looking for that I realized I needed was work-life balance. Now, this isn't something I always thought I wanted because in college, when I did engineering, I thought I have to succeed. I have to do this. What's next? Let me work constantly. Like I found a lot of my value in my work and then it took graduating and having some free time to realize, okay, well now I work till I die. So what else is there other than work? Cause I Not want to life to have more meeting. Yeah. And so 
it's interesting, I guess, from your perspective, if somebody comes to you guys and they they prioritize work life balance, is that something that you guys would say you respond to well? From what I can see, it sounds like it. But what would you say if someone said in an interview that work life balance is important to them? Bobby, start off by saying the pandemic changed everything. I mean, there are things yeah. that all employers are talking with potential employees about uh, that they didn't three to five years ago. Uh, it's all emerged because a lot of us worked from home for a long period of time and got used to it. And employers found that that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, yeah. Maybe, and I, you'll see the numbers going down for complete remote work because you also don't want to totally detach from the culture of your organization. You want to collaborate and be with the people that you work with and you work better. But there, mm -hmm. we've adapted by going forward with what we call a flexible work arrangement. If you could do better working from home on a particular day or a couple of days during a period of time, you negotiate that directly with your supervisor because in our field, the technology is always at the client site. So one way or another, we have to have people there for, for the technology yeah. that we do. But there are aspects of pretty much every job where you can easily do it from home. And uh, today with the technology, it's very easy. We're on your podcast, which is basically Teams or Zoom or whatever you yeah. will. Uh, it's wonderful. I work from home, for example, on Fridays. And we had a big meeting last Friday. I had six little screens on my, my laptop. And we concluded the meeting. We knew what we needed to do. We moved on. And none of us had to leave our homes. So we have a flexible policy where we realize that that's what a lot of people want today. And we, we try our very best to accommodate them. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, okay, so next I want to ask for the theme of the failing for you. Okay. If you could tell us a story about a time you either were hiring someone or in the process of being hired yourself, where maybe you failed and learned something and just some sort of takeaways and lessons that you got in that process. All right. Well, failure is my middle name, and my last <laughs> my my last name is success. So. Oh yeah. I think so because we learn from failure. Uh, just what your program is all about. If we don't, you know, then we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And you know, if we do that, shame on us. So yeah, then it's just insanity. So I'll give an example of myself rather than to just okay. pull somebody out of my fast memory uh, data banks. Uh, when I was in well, well, when I was in high school, uh, okay. it was pretty much known that I was a good writer. I mean, my English instructor, the principal of our private school, uh, some of the career services people back then said, you know, Mark, you ought to look into getting a degree in journalism, perhaps. You know, you write very yeah. well. So I, I took that seriously, and I applied to a number of schools, including the one I chose, which was Syracuse University. Of course, they had the SI Newhouse program, where just about everybody yeah. in broadcasting and many people in journalism have gone through. Uh, I was a couple years behind Bob Costas. I knew some of the people that you see on Ooh. TV, and, and I actually majored in broadcast journalism, so it was going to be wow. more about that than it was about the other kind. Uh, mm -hmm. But I got out of college, and I had met somebody in college. We decided to get married, and my mother-in-law was future mother-in-law at that point, worked for Bloomingdale's department store. And she mm -hmm. was in their construction department. She had a lot of pull with management there. And said, hey, management, my future son-in-law is looking for a job. He's just out of college. Um, are you uh, interested in interviewing him? And, and back then, and I think they probably still do, Bloomingdale's had a wonderful buyer trainee program. They took in people from all over the country and developed them to you know, be the, the Cadillac of their industry, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I kept arguing with her saying, I'm, I'm really looking for something in journalism. Uh, I really, yeah. and she kind of made fun out of it because back in those days, people in journalism didn't do very well. And if you got into broadcast journalism, you started in a small market somewhere in Podunk somewhere and had to work mm -hmm. your way up to the big city if you were able to get there. And if you weren't, well, then you weren't going to be very successful. So I agreed. I said, okay, let's give this a shot. I kind of had an interest in what we call HR because I had taken a college class called the elective, the sociology of work, and I loved the professor and I loved the class. So that was the beginning of what was seeping into my head, but didn't really know what to do with it. So I, I yeah. took this position. 
Well, it took me about two weeks to realize I absolutely hated it, just dreaded it. You know, my parents <laughs> were in the retail business. They had a very, very successful floor covering business. They offered it to me. I didn't want it. I'm not yeah. interested in what kind of carpet somebody wants, whether it's green or blue. That's just not what I'm about. So <laughs> I walked into that training department at Bloomingdale's and told them that I quit. And they looked at me and said, nobody quits the training department at Bloomingdale's. I said, well, I do. I said, I'm not happy. This is just not for me. Yeah. So I left there. Meanwhile, my wife didn't <laughs> didn't get a job at Bloomingdale's. I oh, don't know my why goodness. my mother-in-law didn't put her there. Maybe she wanted to get rid of yeah. me, so she put me in a bad place. But uh, my wife was working for an uh, insurance company for the mail handler's benefit plan in New York, and she had gotten it from an employment agency on Fifth Avenue. So she said, Mark, why don't you contact that employment agency, and maybe they have something for you. So, sure, okay. So I set up an appointment, went there. I sat down with this woman, uh, Sonia Jacobs, and she said, Mark, guess what? You're for this business. I can tell by your personality. Oh You'd be goodness. very good at this. Nobody that I've ever met ever grew up wanting to be a recruiter. They don't even, <laughs> I didn't even know what it was when I was a kid. You want yeah. to be a fireman, a police chief, never a recruiter. You, you kind of find your way into it via some mm -hmm. other odd entry point. Yeah. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I said, well, what's the pay? And I was living in New Jersey, by the way. I said, $95 a week. This is back in 1979. You know, the average okay. pay in 1979 was about $10,000 a year. This wasn't mm -hmm. even that. And I was commuting via bus. So I was paying more than I could make as it was a draw. So when you got commission, <laughs> they took that back and then they gave you the uh -huh. difference. Yeah. So it was a struggle because I wasn't from Manhattan. I didn't have any clients. I had to develop them. Meanwhile, in this particular agency, people were coming and going because the boss was basically, you got four weeks to make a placement. If you don't make a placement, you're out. Well, oh I made a goodness. placement in two weeks, and then I made another one. Wow. I made another one. And somehow, I gravitated to the uh, financial industry. I had a lot of clients like Prudential Beach and some others, and you know, it, it, it really was good. And uh, I, I said to myself, you know, what am I doing this in New York City for? There's got to be mm -hmm. jobs like this out in New Jersey. I won't yeah. have to commute as far. So I got into the training program at Management Recruiters, uh, which was a big organization at that time, and they had great training, and I developed myself there. And at that point, I realized I love doing this. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. I get to meet different people. I, I get to work on different assignments. You know, my claim to fame is I must have hired 100,000 people in my life and it never worked a Goodness. day because <laughs> – I send them off to do the engineering. I send them yeah. off to do the accounting. I don't do any of that stuff. I it's just find them. Buddy. Exactly. So uh, I got a call from a career school, a uh, vocational school, and they were looking for a basically a career services director. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I loved the idea of that, and I, and I took the role. It was a little school called Union Technical Institute. It's gone now. They closed down in the early 90s. They had been in business, I think, at that time for 47 years. Oh, wow. And I, I turned that school into something very, very special because within me, I had this ability to do really good PR and marketing. And I said, you know, these people here deserve a chance. Let me see what I can do to really bring attention to this. Mm -hmm. So I started doing things like we're doing now. I got myself on different cable TV programs and articles and uh, I made an arrangement with my with Syracuse University to give these students some credits when they graduate, just a few, and then took yeah. that information and gave it to the local newspaper, the Asbury Park Press, where I became HR director years later, which is kind of funny. Oh, my goodness. But, uh, and they picked it up, and they ran stories on it. And uh, we, during uh, the major recession in the early 80s, when Ronald Reagan was president, we had a, something like a 95% career job placement rate. In other words, 95% wow. of the students were getting good jobs, work, working really hard on it. And that was a one-man show for them. And uh, I sent that information to President Reagan. And President Reagan <laughs> did said— Did he respond? Yes, he did. I still have the letter. I wish I had it in my office oh, here. Oh, my goodness. He said that, you know, records are made to be broken. He said 95% is an absolute amazing statistic for placement during these times. And yeah. when the school closed, I was able to get that letter. I have it hanging on a wall at my house. But— you know, I, I get more and more at that time into what I was doing, and then things broke. What happened was then is that one of the companies that was hiring my students offered me a job. 
So I was able to make the transition from headhunter to career services director to human resources. And from there I moved up and I got as high as director of human resources for the Asbury Park Press, which was the Asbury Park Press was the paper for central New Jersey. They also wow. own the Home News and Tribune, which I was over as well. And New Jersey 101.5, which is their major broadcast station for New Jersey. Uh, so I got to live out both dreams, doing the well, recruiting yeah, piece, seriously. back to the broadcasting piece. It's uh, amazing. It, you did it. It all came from failing at Bloomingdale's. I found out that there was something that I didn't want to do, and it forced me to go look for something I wanted to do. And once I found it, shot right up. Wow. How hard was it to quit that job knowing that your future mother-in-law was the one that set you up with it? I, ne like, was, I never listened to her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> She's gone now, so I can say anything I want. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you are too funny. I was going to say, because I feel like something I have such a hard time with, even when I don't like a job, is quitting it. Like I always felt so nervous to quit jobs growing up anytime I'd have a job. Even if it was like working at a grilled cheese joint, I was just like, how are they going to live without me? And then they were fine. You know, so it's okay if a place isn't right for you. Staying there isn't going to help you unless you literally can't find anything else. Well, that's right. And that's what I tell. Since I had the career services background, we interview a lot of what we call control systems engineers, which are just out of college. You know, they're mm -hmm. either coming to us either as interns, co-ops, or, or new grads. And, and, you know, sometimes they know and we know that it's probably not a good fit. And I have no problem being open and honest and giving them some good career advice. I said, look, I'm going to take off my recruiter's hat and put on my career services hat. And I'll, <laughs> and I'll tell them, like a few weeks ago, I had one candidate, good candidate, uh, right out of school who was being interviewed for two different jobs at our company. Uh, one was for a controls engineer. The other was for a sales engineer. Completely mm -hmm. different spectrums. Oh, yeah. And when I, I spoke know. with him, I, I said, well, you, know, you have to decide which position are you most interested in. He says, well, he said, I think I'm going to go for the control systems engineer. I said, well, why? He said, because I think that's the job that I'm closest to getting, and that's kind of where I'm headed. I said, well, that's really not the best answer. I said, which is the job <laughs> that you think you'd like to work 40 hours a week for the next several years at, as opposed mm -hmm. to grabbing the low-hanging fruit, which, as I had at Bloomingdale's, wasn't the best decision for me. You know, yeah. by the time we got done and I asked him to cite me some examples as to why one over the other, we we finally finished up knowing where the best fit would be. Uh, the individual was hired, by the way, uh, hoping oh, things will work you. out, but yes. at least hired into what he thinks he will do best at and be most satisfied with. And as I explained, mm -hmm. and the good news is it's not the last job you're ever going to have, even at our company. Uh, there are opportunities. We post things internally. If you may want to shift over to a sales engineering role, you, you may have that opportunity. You know, we're not mm -hmm. going to delimit that if we think and he thinks that that would be the best place for him. And he's overall a good employee. So sometimes you get a second chance. But the bottom line is to try your very, very best to do your homework. Find out as much as you can about a career, the pros and the cons. Talk to people maybe in those jobs. Read up on it. I mean, Google's a wonderful thing. You can read anything on anything. And, uh, and then really test your gut and find out whether or not it's the right move for you. Because, yes, we all career flounder. There are probably little jobs I've had that I don't even factor into my experience. But yeah. you know what? If you do the things that you should be doing to find out what you want to do, you can at least shortcut to where you're going to be. You get there earlier, so to speak, rather than waste time a year or two here and there and maybe get into your career a little earlier. When you think about it, we don't have a really large window of, of very productive prime years. You know, you mm -hmm. get out of college at 21, you know, by 40, a lot of companies are saying, ah, let's hire the new kid on the block. Yeah. You know, I've got a nephew that's 45 and they're trying to write him off already. He's got many, many more oh productive years doing what he does. He's, yeah. a, he's a liquor salesman. He probably makes about 400 grand a year, but uh, they're thinking, oh gee, I can get five guys that don't make that much and you know, It'll work out well. I can grow them all. You know, this guy's really at a mm -hmm. high level. But, uh, you know, you only have that, that window of maybe until you get up to speed experience-wise, maybe 30 to 40 or whatever. So I'd rather see somebody get to the place they want to start out at 
by 22, 23 rather than 27 mm -hmm. or 28. And, and that gives them more earning potential and it also puts them in a better position, I think, to grow with a particular company or within a particular industry. So I try to give that kind of advice as best as I can. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we get off the phone and we, we kind of virtually shake hands and realize it's probably not the best place, not probably not the best opportunity. And that's great because we don't make a mistake. They don't make a mistake. And they're going to remember us and say, you know, where everybody else didn't even send me an email or a letter saying I didn't get the job or, or that when I called, they were like, hmm, ah, ooh, ah, e. This fellow at least took the time to talk to me about a little bit of what might help. Uh, yeah. So it's, it helps us, I think, with our reputation. If you go on Glassdoor, Absolutely. we have wonderful reviews because I love that for you. Everybody here is kind of like me. You know, we're people, people, and uh, it, it it is a fun place to work because our ownership is so progressive that we're we're very open to being who we are. You know, and uh, a lot of companies don't do that; they're very rigid. For sure. So, in, on the the note of people, people. A question I have, which I think you sort of touched on, is if somebody is an engineer, okay. I think you may have realized the pattern of not a large percentage of engineers often have great people skills and sometimes struggle to do interviews where they may be a really good fit for the job, but they kind of struggle with the soft skill side, which is really important in an interview. Do you ever have like tricks for them or something that you can help them with if they feel like they struggle talking to people but they are qualified or they have the potential to be but they just don't know how to present themselves because they get really nervous or just have a hard time putting things into i don't know wording that makes any sense like what would you say to the engineers out there that are trying to get jobs but lack the soft skills or feel that they do well, first of all, a, a shout out to all the colleges and universities, which really need to be doing a better job with soft skills. You know, mm -hmm. I think people take for granted that, hey, I've gotten jobs at Burger King, McDonald's. I can make my way through. <laughs> uh, but the bottom line is when you get at this level of industry and business, it, you're looking, companies, employers are looking for a whole heck of a lot more. You're dealing with customers, you know, but different industries and different companies where, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands or million dollars in contracts and you certainly yeah. want to be able to write well and speak well and make good presentations and know how to collaborate with people and uh, you know be able to uh, have a, a level of EQ or emotional maturity. Uh, there's so many soft skills that I think we could focus on that probably spend the whole session on each one. But <laughs> I, I don't think colleges or high schools even play up enough about the importance of it. People take it for granted, thinking that when they get out of college, they're the finished product. There's nothing more to learn. Mm -hmm. They're ready yeah. to roll. And there's a sense of sophistication, I think, that is kind of unwise that, well, the technical stuff is the stuff I'm getting hired for. You know, that's the stuff that really needs the brain power. You know, I got to know my math. I got to know my science. You know, what is this soft skill stuff? But mm -hmm. uh, I, I, from my perspective, when I speak to somebody whether I'm coaching or counseling them just to help them because we have a lot of people here that have children that are getting jobs. We try to help them. I'll help them with their resume. I'll, I'll coach them. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll share with them the way that they should present themselves, the things that they should uh, explain that they know about to prospective employers. You know, mm -hmm. the, whether it's enthusiasm, you know, you get people, the words and music don't get together. I'm really excited about this job. <laughs> I think it's going to be great for me. You know, people don't see themselves. And it's sad that they go on an interview and they come out and, well, how'd you do? I think I did really well. Oh, no. Did you really do well? You got to prep. They got to prep. They got to yeah. think about if I were hiring somebody, all the money that I had in the bank I was going to share with them, what would I be looking for? Would I be looking mm -hmm. for this? Or would I be looking for somebody who maybe not jump out of their seat, but somebody yeah. who's, and I'll put it in, a, a, I'll put it in a, a note about a candidate. This individual really is passionate about engineering. Mm -hmm. That says a lot to his potential manager because that person will not have to be motivated. That person will hit the ground running. They're going to want to learn everything and do everything and see everything. Won't have to be pushed. You know, so that's one example of people may not realize how they're coming yeah. across 
They didn't practice. They didn't read up on it. There's so many wonderful books and so many wonderful YouTubes on each soft skill that it's a shame that people don't take more time to seek these things out. Absolutely. And like you were inferring, tone is so important. My dad growing up, he's not an engineer, but he was a salesperson in the car industry. And so growing up, he would always tell us tone is 90%. Tone is so important. Like it doesn't matter what you say if your tone does not match what you're saying or else it, it just, it isn't true. And so whenever I would, you know, have an important interview coming up, like we would prep back and forth. And if I would answer something and my tone would go up, he's like, are you lying about the answer? Because that's how it's coming off. And I'm like, no, I just got nervous. And he's like, okay, pay attention to your body language. Like, is it open? Is it closed off? And just all those tips that, it, like you said, they're not on a resume, but they're things that people really can feel coming off of you. And they are important. And guys, if you are looking for tips and things like this of, you know, how to interview, how to have some good industry knowledge. You should follow Mark on LinkedIn because Mark posts a lot of really good, helpful content on a regular basis. It's well thought out and he is the guy for you. So if you don't get to experience him in an interview one-on-one, -on -one, at the least, you should be following him on LinkedIn. He puts out great stuff there. Let me throw, now, this, Mark, let me throw this out to you yeah. too. I also run a very successful group on Facebook with 21,000 members called the Careers and Jobs Advice Forum. I, I definitely okay. recommend anybody looking for a job to go there because uh, it has built a good reputation of other people that are members helping out people that have a problem. So if you post an issue that you have, something work-related or looking for a job, you will find a lot of really good advice coming to people, including career counselors, uh, at no yeah. charge. So definitely look for the Jobs and Careers Advice Forum on Facebook and join. Uh, there's a lot of good information, articles, et cetera, that we post in addition to LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, yeah. I also run a group uh, for engineers called the ABCs of Control Systems Engineers. I yes. recommend you join that because that's a little different than my main page, which I kind of focus more on training and development. So mm -hmm. there you're in with uh, at least, I think we're up to 7,000 uh, control systems engineers, professors, uh, industry leaders, etc. And it's a good way to network, so you should definitely be there as well. Uh, and then finally, my email address is to write to me. Uh, I think we'd like to have would be Mark, M-A-R-C, dot Levine, L-E-V as in victory, I-N-E, at thermosystems.com. I'm glad to handle anything that you need one-on-one. -on -one. Guys, we will link all of that in the show notes below. Mark, I'll have you send me those afterwards. That way you guys don't have to like write all of it down as you go. We'll put his email. We'll put all of the websites that we just mentioned. That way you can refer back, join the groups, and get all the advice you can out of Mark. Um, so... Mark, next question. This is something that I didn't realize I needed to do until my second job out of college. When we're in an interview, we're so focused on trying to wow the interviewer and sell ourselves to them that sometimes we forget to let the, the company sell itself to us. How do we make sure that we actually want to work there? I know out of college, a lot of times we're in a position of desperation, so we forget to make sure we want to work there. But if we want to stay at a job, I would think it's important to like where you're working. So how do you kind of interview the company back to make sure it's a good place to work? Well, start with Glassdoor. That's kind of where everybody starts. You'll see what mm -hmm. current and recently employed people at that company have to say. Uh, you could also reach out to people on LinkedIn that have either worked for the company or still work there. Uh, you'll mm -hmm. find that most people will respond to you and, uh, yeah. and tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> you always should go to a qu interview with at least five questions. Write them down on a three by five card if you need to. But they should be questions that discuss many different parts of the interview. It could be the job duties and responsibilities itself. It could be mm -hmm. questions about the culture of the company, which is what you're referring to. You know, it could be questions uh, having to do with uh, the products or the services. You know, I have some people that maybe they're interested really in aeronautics or, you know, they want to work for NASA. Industrial controls maybe not be of interest as much. Or working mm -hmm. with power and HVAC, maybe they want to work in another area of our huge industry, oil and gas, mining. So you should yeah. ask questions about all these things because... It's all important, you know, all of it factors into what your job is gonna look like and how you're gonna feel while you're there. 
so yeah, definitely bring those questions with you. And certainly don't be bashful to ask follow-up questions. I mean, if, <laughs> if you don't feel like the question was answered fully, uh, it's a two-way street in an interview. It, we, we all tend to think it's all on the employer, but it's not. Uh, you know, you're both making a decision. It's like real estate. You've got a seller and a buyer, mm -hmm. you know, and the real estate agent is in the middle. So you've, you certainly uh, are on good ground to say, you know, tell me a little bit more about the culture. How does it manifest itself? What is it that you do? I mean, I'll tell people, you know, we buy lunch for everybody here at the company every day, all 250 people. Uh, guess what? We have our 25th anniversary coming up. The owner of the company is taking every single employee and their family on an all-expenses-paid trip to Disney World in June. Wow. Yep, this is what we do here. We want to make sure that people working together – have some free time to spend. It helps them collaborate better. We don't want to penalize their families. So we don't want to say, well, Johnny's going to be away for work on next weekend. He's going to Florida. You stay home. So not, <laughs> yeah. No, Mrs. Johnny or, or Mr. Johnny or the kids. Yeah. Bring them along. You know, learn about what Thermo is like to work for. We oh, have Thermo Giving. We have Thermo Ween. We have Oktoberfest. <laughs> it's all developed to build that work balance that you're talking about. To make it that it's not so hard to get up in the morning to come to work. I love coming to work every day here. This yeah, is just the amazing. best job I've ever had. It took me 41 years to find I just dated myself. 41 years to find it. I mean, I've worked for some really tough organizations uh, where there was none of this. But we work hard. We do very well. And we get to play hard. And the ownership, they were engineers themselves. So they know what an engineering day looks like. Yeah. So when they're talked to by other engineers, they know they have good days and bad days, and this is how they handle it, down to earth and uh, very easily approachable. And they realize that whatever they can do to make our lives pleasant, they do. I wish every employer in America was that way, but unfortunately they're not. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Goodness, guys, you need to go all work for thermal Come, systems. come. <laughs> Okay, I, I got a lot of my questions answered, so I want to shift into the segment, okay. which is failures, lessons, and questions. This is where our audience writes in, and they have given some specific questions for you. They gave a lot. We will not be able to get to all of them, so I'm going to scan these real quick and see which one is one of the better ones. Okay. Okay, so I would ask this, but it sounds like you kind of answered it, which is, the best way to keep talented people once you hire them. Clearly, Thermo Systems is a good model for how you keep people. Um, let's see. So we talked about that a lot of kids coming out of college struggle with the soft skills. But what are some of the more positive trends you've seen recently with people coming out of college? Has there been anything different in the last few years? Any skill sets? Any like attitude shifts? Like What have you seen in a positive trend that's been with the new college students? You know, I, I really am impressed with the Generation Z in particular, and millennials to a degree. Um, there's more of a sense of having an idea of where they want to go, and there's more of an interest in how they're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And that shows up in a lot of the studies that are saying that they want to be further developed. Uh, we have a great learning development program here called Thermo University. It's not here by accident. It's by here because that's what they want. It's by here because that's what they need. Uh, and we go into everything, including soft skills, uh, because we're developing people for the future. I mean, we're going to get our future management from those ranks. But the approach of these new grads, I think, is just wonderful. I don't know what happened to cause that. I don't know if they had more time to <laughs> contemplate during the pandemic. Yeah. But it's so much easier for us to offer what they need knowing already what they're looking for, you know, and that's kind of why we add a lot of the programs we add because we know that's what they want and we can do it. That's awesome. Okay, so this kind of moves into the next question, which will make our last question, okay. which is when a tech, sorry, when a technical expert is moved to a management position, how can they be prepared for the change in responsibilities and roles? How can supervisors and HR be sure that a technical is right for such a promotion? So essentially, if you have like an engineer who's very technical, you're moving them up to management. How can they be prepared to be a manager after being so technical? And I guess he's assuming that they lack soft skills. Right, right. Well, the answer is very easy there. Again, it's learning and development. We have a management training program. You got to invest in your employees. You got to invest in your, we call them team members here. 
Um, mm -hmm. A company growing like we are, which just a few years back maybe had 60, 70 employees. Our goal for the end of this year is 325. We have, wow. what, 19 or 20 offices now, including overseas in Denmark and, and Ireland. And we're going to start doing some work in Germany. So we know what our future seems to be. Uh, we're a 120 yeah. plus million dollar company. And like uh, as a result, we know that the leaders are probably best coming from within. Why? Because they already understand our culture. We want to promote mm -hmm. that culture. We don't want to bring in people that don't know or embrace it because that will change who we are. That will change our secret sauce, what made us so successful. So yeah. we invest in management training. It's formal training. Uh, and we also offer tuition reimbursement to people here on top of that. So uh, they can go out and get further degrees. We support certifications. Uh, you know, companies can't just add water and get managers. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They're also, to be honest, you know, they're going to sit with a director and kind of get a feel for whether or not management is the right track. We have three career tracks here. One is technical. They can do many, many things on the technical side, move all the way up to a technical director if they wish, or move more into the management. Uh, next step would be maybe project management, where they get to run a whole project. You know, it could be a $20, 30000000 million assignment. Or they can, wow. as I mentioned before, sales engineering, which is exciting. Colleges yeah. don't even talk about it. When I talk to people about sales engineering, oh, I don't want a job at Best Buy. This is not Best Buy. This is all about your engineering knowledge up against some pretty sharp people at potential mm -hmm. clients, plant oh, engineers, yeah. plant managers. Before they spend $20, $30, 40000000 million, they want to know that they're going to get what they need, and they want you to be consultative so that you tell them what you can do for them that will solve their problems. So it's a very exciting role that I wish the colleges would talk up a little rather than me yeah. saying, and then they say, oh, light bulb goes on. That might be right. <laughs> but we prepare them for all these things, and then it's their choice as well as with, that, with their managers whether or not they'd be the right fit for that particular role. That's really cool. I love that. Well, I think we're just about getting to the end of our time for today. Okay. This has been an amazing episode. Mark, you are just a natural at this. I can't wait for when you have a podcast one day. It's going to be my favorite. I already know it. But guys, in the meantime, like I said, we will link all of his socials and contact information below so you can find him and connect with him. But Mark, is there any remaining thoughts that you have or things you want to share before we sign off? Well, I can tell your audience, live a good life. Don't waste a moment not enjoying. I'm a cancer survivor. I mean, I should have wow. been gone 17 years ago when they discovered esophageal cancer. I had chemo and surgery and complications. It changed my life. It taught me how precious life is and how important it is to live every day, one day at a time, but at the same time, enjoy those days to do the things you like. You know, life is too short to do things you don't enjoy. If you pick up a yeah. book and you don't like it, why read it? Start a movie that you don't like, why watch it? Start a <laughs> job you don't like, why stay there? And, and there yeah. I learned that early. I mean, Bloomingdale's what's for me. Fine company. People are there. I'm sure they're doing very well. But that's just not one place out of, what, 330 or 340,000 career possibilities. I deleted one. But wow. I was able early on to find my passion and find a field where it's continually growing and there are different aspects of it. Keeps my interest going. A lot of my friends have retired already. I have no intention of doing that. I'm a 20-year-old locked in a 66-year-old a man's body. And I have more <laughs> energy here than most people because I love what I do. I, I think I everybody that. should feel that way. And when you do, you'll find you do much better work and you'll be much happier. So I leave you with that. And uh, I look forward to meeting many of you. So reach out to me. I'm, I'm more than happy to give you some pointers or maybe even consider you for a job. Thank you so much, Mark. I feel so inspired right now, and I know all of our listeners will too. Once again, thank you for coming on the thank podcast. Thank you for having me. Guys, I'm your host, Jordan Yates, and in the meantime, I'll be failing for you. See you next week. Bye.